Welcome back and thanks so much for staying with us. The ANC Youth League in Limpopo issued a statement on the dire state painted by the Auditor General. The Youth League shares similar sentiments on the matter. They say their provincial governance has regressed terribly compared to the previous administration. And the Youth League says that they are studying the reports from the Auditor General and Standing Committee on Public Accounts on the state of the Limpopo govern government. They have, however, vowed not to let degeneration of governance happen in their presence. And the Youth League in Limpopo says, and I quote, we are deeply concerned about the state of this provincial administration since 2014, 15, 16 and 17 because it uh, regrettably regressed compared to the previous administrations. The public will soon know about the truth and someone must account to all the shenanigans occurring in our government and decisions will be taken, end quote. Limpopo, we are continuing to regress and as a province we are being made to to celebrate uh, mediocrity and, you know, setting our standards very low because you would have seen last week the Premier and his team went around parading about two trophies uh, claiming that they got lean audits in Department of Treasury and some agency gambling board. But when you look deeper as you analyze the, the, the documents from the Auditor General, you, do, you find that none of the departments uh, has really, you know, improved, but... Uh, we have regressed, and we attribute this thing uh, to weak leadership that we have in the province. Scopa uh, had sent out an invite to journalists to say, let's come and discuss this thing, we're worried. We now know that at some stage there was an intervention to say, no, stop this thing because it will embarrass uh, the province. First things we are, we, are, we are rejecting. If we are not doing good, we must be able to tell that people that we are not doing good, we are, we are ready to... To, to, to fix, but when you try to cover them up, it means that you are not uh, having the will to correct all those ills that we are, have been uh, uncovered by the Auditor General. Joining us live in studio is Chair Silane, ANC Youth League Limpopo Secretary General, Jackie Shando is a political commentator, and Oliver Dixon is a social political analyst joining us on the phone. Good evening to all our guests, and thank you so much for joining us. Chair, let's just uh, look at what's currently happening in Limpopo. It's also a province that has been embattled with a lot of controversy, not only about tender rigging, it was put under administration, it had the issue around uh, access to education, etc. What is going on? Look, uh, immediately when the government that was led by Premier Matawata, when it was uh, disbanded, the ANC, uh, under the president, the leadership of the ANC president, Jacob Zuma, they took a decision to intervene and call the Premier of Limpopo, Premier Stanley Matawata, for him to come and address the challenges that were in actual fact been alleged to be there. And now Matabata has been given that particular chance to address all the allegations that were leveled against the, the then Premier uh, Stan Matabata with regard to corruption and all those kind of things. And Premier Matabata had to resign, I mean Mat Matale has to resign. Then come Matabata, he finished 18 months. Uh, which was supposed to be f been finished by the then premier. Yeah, pl please just summarize first. Yeah, in, in the and interest now, of time. And now, what is happening here is that we still see the continuation of what has actually happened in the in, in actual fact in the previous administration. We thought that when Matabata come and 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 to, in, to come to Limpopo, there will be a lot of uh, things that will be resolved, especially with regard to corruption, especially with regard to. Uh, facilitating the issue of access to, 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 to higher education, the issue of, of, of empowering young people, and all those kind of things. But it's quite unfortunate that we see something contrary. Yeah, as you just uh, hold the thought, I mean, corruption, we, we hear this loosely and it's overused, um, and we, there's no accountability. People get off with impunity. And, and even still, all of this, when it's happening, clearly there's a lot of fingers in the pie where, where it's perpetuated, the chaos is created, there's inability to even account for wasteful expenditure. Why, how did the, the, the ANC government get to this point in, in some of these uh, administrations? <laughs> well, uh, good evening, Sidi, and good evening to the viewers. Uh, it's, sh it's shocking but uh, unsurprising, really. And we always make the fact that if you are going to transition from institutionalized 
oppression and exclusion of the black majority, particularly from mainstream economic participation, and you moved into a democratic dispensation, that still, in many ways, does not address the structural exclusion. What then happens, and it's not, it doesn't start here in South Africa, it starts right in the 1950s when the first African states begin to gain, gain their independence from colonial masters, that the political class becomes so preoccupied with the public sector and the state, and the means of production, the real economy, is left in the hands of either colonial settlers, in, 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 in our case, because we have settler whites, or the very same multinational corporations that used to benefit from colonialism, the post-colonial state, they continue to benefit, and the vast majority of the formerly oppressed native people remain excluded. So and you're saying the crumbs which is left in the government coffers is the only other... It's a means, means yeah. for social upward mobility for the political class. It lends itself to corruption. And we can say by all accounts in South Africa today, in the public sector, in the main, corruption is institutionalized because there is no space. 70% of economic activity happens in the private sector. So you are dealing with less than 30% of the national wealth. That must service the poor. But unfortunately, the poor find themselves having to share it with People in the political sphere who are very ambitious, who also want to become multimillionaires because they see the Ruperts, they see the Oppenheimers, mm. and they say, why, are, why is it only them who are entitled to the good life? And unfortunately, the bulk of this money that must go to service the poor, somewhere, somehow, finds its way into, into the wrong pockets. So it's, a, it's an issue that ne needs to be broadened. What we get wrong in this country, in terms of our narrative, our discussion about corruption, we tend to always reduce it to, confine it to, to the public sector, as if the public sector is not linked in, in, inextricably interwoven with the private sector. So you find that even if you go and do the investigation in, in terms of what is happening in Limpopo today, a lot of private sector corporations have unduly benefited from certain contracts and it becomes very difficult even though we are very much against corruption and those who are corrupt must be pursued, but there is always an invisible hand of white capital mm. that gets those tenders and, and, and whatever service they are providing, there's an agreement that will raise the tariffs, the rate, and then I will get 10% and you get this. So you need a very comprehensive anti-corruption apparatus that will deal with both the, the public sector people who are in a position to channel yeah. these contracts illegally. Mr. Oliver uh, Dixon, and I, and, sure. I, and I agree with you that maybe the focus and energy and resources need to be looked at uh, not from the cor corrupter and the corruptee, primarily on, on who stands to benefit from government tenders because the approach would be either it's the premier or uh, it's alleged to be the president, etc., and not necessarily following the trail um, as to who are, are, are beneficiaries of lucrative tenders. No, look, uh, I, I think Jackie may have been bordering dangerous lines there when he uh, attributed the corrupt behavior of state officials to uh, them benchmarking their lives similar to that of the Ruperts and the Oppenheimers. I think corruption and greed is an innate, an inherent uh, uh, human trait that needs to be unrooted by our political system. Unfortunately, our political system gives us all the benefit of the doubt, and it doesn't unroot the inherent uh, 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 greediness within what uh, humankind, especially if those people are poor. Okay. That's not to say that mm. poor people are, 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 are by themselves corrupt or that poor people cannot be honorable beings. I think our political system has allowed for a, a network of corrupt officials to grow. So we often point to corruption uh, in the premier's office or the president's office. But corruption begins with the, the municipal manager. Corruption begins with uh, the councillors who become members on tender committees, who appoint, uh, who, who award tenders to certain companies, and they almost always make sure it's in favor of companies they are able to extract money out of themselves, directly or indirectly. Mm. Uh, so I think that's where the network of corruption needs to be nipped in the bud. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about a conversation a um, while back, and I don't know if I should still refer to KPMG, but one of their researchers had spoken about the, the lack of... Uh, 
capacity, incompetence, and a number of other issues that plague most of, of, of the government departments, that people have, don't have the ability to do their work, and those that are opportunistic will find ways to take advantage of that situation. Could this be the case in Limpopo, or do you, do you have a particular culprit that you say, the rot lies with this person and, and they need to go? Look, in Limpopo, we've got a situation where, for example, people do, especially not only managers, but leaders, do as they wish. For a typical example, we had Mapungubi, uh, Mapungube, uh, I think, just the festival, which was uh, done uh, last year. What happened in that Mapungube is that uh, the MEC, for example, of, of sports, arts and culture, for example, gave a tender to her own uh, uh, husband. And for example, when you check in terms of the rating and, and, the, and the percentages on how they've procured those particular uh, 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 tender projects, you find that the plate was even uh, sell, sold uh, with 500. So no, no one even, even here today is able to say, no, there is a corruption and the perpetrator must be brought to books and this is what is happening. People, they do as they wish because they are leaders. And now, for example, even the enemies of sports and culture was not even brought to books, mm. was not even uh, 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 investigated. Everything, public funds have been squandered as if uh, uh, there is nothing or there's no institution of government that can able to cap that corruption, mm. which is happening in the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture. And it is very much wrong. For example, there was even the textbook saga, which was hap happened in the Department of uh, uh, education. education. People are just lazy to do, to, to do their work when there was a duty on them to, to perform. What, what was the reason for them to keep, for example, for such a huge time, not even account or to respond to the public on the challenges that were facing uh, the government of Limpopo by then? Now, sorry, because they can't think. Is this, yeah, sorry, sorry, Chair. Is, is this a, a self-fulfilling prophecy, as we've heard former President Halima Mutlante saying? Perhaps the 2019 would be a, a rude awakening for the ANC if they were not in the majority for them to, for, for to self-correct um, and, and deal with the issue of corruption. I mean, if to, what he's saying mm -hmm. is, is truly an indictment that willy-nilly monies are just squandered. It's, it's, it's a matter of uh, chickens coming home to roost, really. Uh, we shouldn't be surprised. And if, you, if we study, if we do a close analysis, scientific study, in terms of the economic fortunes of the post-colonial state in Africa, starting in Ghana, going to Kenya, to Nigeria, to Angola, to the Congo, here at home. You have this trend starting in the 50s. The failure or perhaps the reluctance to transform, to decolonize, and to uh, uh, meet out social justice. What it translates to is that those who have continued to consolidate more wealth, as the statistics SA, for instance, General Household Survey, always shows us in South Africa. Year in, year out, they have an annual survey. That will tell you that whites have gotten richer since 1994 and black people have gotten poorer. Once you have that, uh, that kind of reality in a country, you will have those who are then mandated to lead feeling incapacitated. There's nothing they can do. The inequality just keeps growing. So what's the next best thing to do? Let's see what we can get for ourselves. Two things I think we need to do if we, if we want to take corruption very seriously and confront it head on. One, you have to create a system where those who are found guilty, those who are accused of corruptions, are taken through the legal processes. Once convicted and sentenced, they either go to jail, but beyond that, you ban them from public service entirely. Once you've been found to have been corrupt as a, a municipal, as a councillor, as a mayor, or as a member of parliament, you can no longer serve. In, uh, become a public servant. We have not th seen that happen. But secondly, equally, those who actually facilitate the corruption, the capitalists, right? Those who own private companies, who are the ones who always go and exploit this vulnerability, this economic vulnerability of public servants. We want this tender, this is what we are going to do. Equally, those must be brought to book and once you as a, a private business have been found to be involved into some corrupt activity negotiation with the public servant, 
you must be banned entirely from participating or into any kind of business with any organ of the state. That is if we but, do but take this thing yeah, seriously. But, but where are the processes? We do have the Public Finance Management Act. We have your procurement uh, processes, checks and balances, all, all sorts of things. Mr. Oliver, where, where do you think are these, these processes uh, just the nice to have and not necessarily implemented? What Jackie is saying is incredibly important, and I think we must all be very cognizant of that. Uh, because the reality is for government officials to be corrupt, there must be a private sector partner willing to cooperate with that corruption. That's just how corruption works. Government does not do business with itself. It does business with the private sector. So the real culprits here are not greedy government officials, but, but greedy uh, uh, um, business officials. So oftentimes these business officials sit on more than one board of directors. They are, uh, you know, managing directors of more than one company or they are shareholders in more than one company. If an official is found to be corrupt, every business they've ever been associated with where they have direct interest in must stop doing business with the state completely. Currently, that's not the case. What happens is that you can be found guilty of corruption, you pay a fine, perhaps go to jail for eight months, come back and you can go back to starting a new business and doing new business with the state or find yourself proxies that will allow you to do business with the state. We think even within those proxies, we must do close investigation. I think we don't do strong enough due diligence uh, in, 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 in uh, discovering who exactly does business with the state, what their history is, and what their connections are. Yeah. I think we need to start doing business with uh, the private sector in that way. All right, just please stay on the line. Chair, it would, I mean, it, did the ANC adopt a mold that already was set in how uh, government officials of, uh, during the uh, apartheid era also benefited, had business interests, owned islands or whatever it is, uh, and, and some still benefiting from, from that kind of system? Do you think that this was simply transformed or uh, transferred to the new government and that's why we're seeing such high levels of corruption? Look, we understand the challenges that the ANC had to face immediately after the strategic breakthrough of apartheid in 1994. The ANC took government, and one of the most important tasks that the ANC has to do was to also capacitate and develop policies that will guide its own cadres that are deployed in government on what needs to be done in terms of keeping corruption, in terms of advancing. Uh, the interest of the people by delivering service to them. So the ANC never told uh, uh, people how to be uh, corrupt. The ANC never told people how to go and squander money. These are the things that we are uh, seeing today, necessarily because of people who don't have or don't have the interest of the ANC at heart. People that are prepared that they can just loot the state resources. In actual fact, they, according to them, how they see things. They think that not the ANC will lose power in 2019. And the mistake that they are doing is that they do that in the name of the ANC, but when the ANC never deployed them to do that in government. And as a cadre who love the people and who love the ANC, one of your responsibility is to ensure that services is not delivered to them, unlike in Nimpopo. In Nimpopo, you can't see services. People do corruption as they wish. No one in actual fact is able to point and say, no, you are corrupt. And even though that, those that are corrupt, they are not even brought to books or even been arrested. What can be done though? And I mean, I can hear your frustration as look, the youth league there. Look, there is no frustration. <laughs> there is no frustration. There is a concern, which I think we must put it clear, that th those that have been seen, like what is happening in the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture, like what is happening there in leader, in the economy, they must be brought to books because there are institutions there of government that will be able to, uh, to assist us to detect that there is a corruption in the department of leader, economic development. There is a department in the... Uh, yeah, but the onus is, Jackie, as sure. well, in those that, that, that feel so strongly about it and you've witnessed uh, the, the level of corruption that's happening there, to go and report, to have enough reputable institutions, public protector, etc., have you done that? Or is it a case of, you know, uh, having sideshows? Look, it's quite unfortunate that we are the youth league, we are, not, uh, in this, we are not in the state. But from day to day, we are able to see the operation of government on whether the government is able to respond positively to the demand of the people. Look, we have lost municipality for the first time ever in the history of Lipopo under the leadership of Stenomatawata. 
And uh, this is as a result of weak and lazy leadership. That is there in those municipalities. Unfortunately, we are sitting here for a typical example. Other newspapers, for example, that are speaking about uh, the, the, the MEC of Cockstar failing her responsibility. And uh, those are as a result of the factional and, 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 and activities that in, are in actual fact been perpetuated by the leadership in particular Premier Stan Matabata. But Cindy, let's uh, be careful also and let's be fair and honest and principled. This is not a uniquely uh, uh, Limpopo uh, uh, sort of reality. I come from KZN. A few years ago we had something called uh, the Manasa Report that implicated MECs in the province, that implicated former mayor high-ranking officials in Etego municipality, in, 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 in provincial governments, in, 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 in KZN. You go to the Eastern Cape, it has a history of just, you know, the state coffers being cleaned, project being, uh, 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 mm. people being paid. You go to, to Mpumalang. So I, I'm saying this is a, a, a scourge. This is a cancer that has afflicted all tiers of government, national government, uh, provincial governments, it's even worse at municipal level. And I'm saying, if indeed the ANC government wants to retain power in 2019, it's not a given, it's not guaranteed, and, and because the people of South Africa do not owe the ANC, it's another way around, actually. Mm. This is one of the key issues that needs to be discussed in this forthcoming conference. I understand there's a lot of excitement about who should lead, but there are even more pressing issues that the ANC needs to deal with. This scourge of corruption, because you know what it does? It robs us of investing all our energies to the number one challenge that faces South Africa today, which is economic inequality. What then happens? Of course, the media has its own uh, 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 interest in shifting attention away from economic inequality, which is the highest in the world. And this is what is causing even what you were discussing earlier about white capital and the black presenter. What makes those things possible is the economic power that white people continue to hold as a colonial settler minority and the powerlessness of a black majority. The ANC needs to reflect how do we move from a black majority that is economically powerless into a country that will reflect the demographic of, the, of, 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 of this population. Mm. But I mean, the ANC, Mr. Dixon, also is uh, almost painted itself in a corner because of that democratic uh, centralism and the fact that, you know, when you're deployed or you're a representative of a, a branch, you can't just uh, be, be fired, as it were, because the, the other faction may not like that and, uh, you know, punish the party come the elective conference or, or elections. In your view, is this an opportunity also for the ANC to clean up house before the elective conference and also to gain the uh, societal confidence to say, look, we are doing something, not just as, as a, a, a gimmick, but we're trying to restore and, and uh, renew the organization. I think it may be a little too late for the ANC to do uh, all of that. I think it will go back to what Batavide Tlamini said, uh, that, that will demonstrate to us how disabled the ANC is in, in being able to, to clean itself up. And she said very clearly, we all have our own, own small Anyana skeletons. And the significance of that is that even the people who are supposed to be brought to book won't be brought to book because, network, uh, because corruption only continues to live and breathe insofar as it exists within a network. And that network implicates so many people that they don't want to hold to task and to book those who are the big eaters in, in, in corruption. And I think that's what makes it incapable of the ANC to do some housekeeping and clean itself up. I think what the ANC needs to do, though, has re-established its leadership principles because I think those haven't been re-established. It is often thought that uh, councillors and mayors aren't held to the same leadership principles as ministers and presidents and, 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 and DGs and so forth. And I think that's where it needs to begin. I think the ANC needs to go on a, an attitude shift where it teaches people that you are servants and you are not privileged to be in those positions because you are supposed to serve in those positions. Mm. Uh, and I think only then when there's a shift in the attitude of, of leaders, uh, that's to say, 
of state officials. Yeah, to Only invoke the spirit of Tambo. To... Yeah, I, I, I do apologize. We, we're out of time, but as always, so much appreciated. Chair Silane is ANC Youth League Limpopo Secretary General, drove all the way from Limpopo to join us. We appreciate it. And Jackie Shando, political commentator in studio with us. Oliver Dixon, social political analyst, joining us live on the phone. We'll take a quick ad break. Thanks for staying with us.